church. Welcome to First Baptist Fairdale. We are glad that you're here this morning. Even on a yucky, rainy morning morning like today, it is good to be here. It's good to have our, our hearts focused on Christ and to worship Him this morning. I want to invite you to turn in your Bible with me to Psalm 13 for our call to worship. Psalm 13. As you're opening, I uh, just want to remind you that we are going to continue our Focus in February series tonight. That is going to be this evening at 6 o'clock. And we are going to continue talking about translations of the Bible. Tonight we're going to focus specifically on the King James Version. Uh, should we be King James only? Should we not? You probably already have an idea of, of uh, what we think about that since we are not all reading out of the King James Bible. Uh, but that's a great, great conversation, great discussion that we're going to have tonight. So come on out. Also, this Tuesday, uh, March the 2nd, we're going to have a men's ministry dinner. And that's going to be here at the church at 6 p.m. This is open for all men. So we'd love to have you here uh, if you're able and uh, to able to be here on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Again, lots of other announcements. Make sure you're looking at your bulletin. We don't want you to miss anything. But let's look at Psalm 13 for our call to worship. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord... Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. And even though it's rainy and and not a, a nice morning, not easy to get out, God, we're thankful to be here. We are thankful for Sundays. We're thankful for a weekly reminder that Jesus is alive, that he conquered death and he is no longer in the grave, but he's at your right hand. God, he's interceding for us right now at this very moment. God, we are thankful for all that you do for us. God, as we are here to worship, we pray that our hearts would be centered and focused on Jesus. We'd be reminded of his sacrifice, what he has done for us. And God, may we be people who are putting our trust in your steadfast love and that our hearts would be rejoicing in your salvation this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? I was an orphan lost in the fog Running away but not his you go But Father, you were so real I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father, you loved me still And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. And you have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. But Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I and salvation Lord you died that I might reap what you have sown 
I was in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night The Spirit you made me see I swore I knew my way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone The Spirit you moved in Touch my sleep and spirit was awakened. On oh, my dark and heart, the light of Christ has shone. Caught into a kingdom that did not be shaken. Heaven said, I said, my grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. And I will run this race by grace and grace alone. And I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Amen. Would you remain standing and greet one another? Would you return to your seats as we continue in song? Arise, my soul, arise, shake off your guilt. So oh. 
Our scripture reading today is James chapter 5, verses 10 through 11. And while you turn there, um, as many of you know, Pastor Josh Womble was able to go to Mexico this past week, and so he was able to come back safely. And this upcoming Wednesday, we're actually going to be hearing an update from him, just getting a report on how his trip was, and we'll also have an opportunity for questions and answers. So for any questions you have for Josh about how the trip went, uh, make sure you want to come this Wednesday night um, for our prayer service, 
and you'll get to hear the update from him. So James chapter 5, verses 10 through 11. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are compassionate and merciful to us. We thank you that you hold us in the palm of your hand and that you control all things. You are the creator and you are the sustainer. And Lord, we know that we can trust in you. God, I pray this morning as we continue to worship and as we hear your word, Lord, that we would be focused on you. And Lord, that we would have hearts that are humble, hearts that are worshiping you for who you are. Lord, we know that you are holy and you are set apart. So Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit this morning that we may remember that. Lord, remember that you are compassionate and merciful. And Lord, that you are the one who holds us and, and keeps us. So Lord, we praise you and we worship you. Lord, as we continue to sing, give us hearts of praise and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you stand as we continue to sing? Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morning. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our 
Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessing it is to be able to come together and worship you. Um, we, we do acknowledge that our sin is great, but your salvation is greater. And God, we, we put our hope and our faith and our trust in you, that you will redeem us of our sins, that you will forgive us for our the wrongs that we have done. And God, I just pray that right now as we worship you through offering, God, that we would praise you with thankful hearts for all that you have given us. It's this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as Chris just said a few minutes ago, this last week, Pastor Josh Womble was in Mexico. I uh, had a great trip, <clears throat> sent some pictures to, to some of us, and, and we got to see some of the things that he got to do. But what we've been doing in Mexico for the last couple years is training pastors who don't have an opportunity to come to a place like Louisville and attend a seminary like, like many of us have an opportunity to do. And so basically the idea is we take seminary to them. And we provide them with training that's going to be helpful for them as pastors. Uh, and so that's what they've been doing. And this last time, uh, just when Womble was there, they got to graduate these men. Uh, and so that's a huge thing. Uh, we're, we're so excited about that. And so for our time of pastoral prayer this morning, we want to pray for, for the men who just graduated. Uh, as I know that this is a huge blessing not only to them and their families, but also to their churches that they serve. Uh, so let's pray for them and for their churches. Uh, let's do that now. God, we thank you so much that you are a God who is not limited by language. And that as we get outside of Fairdale, Kentucky and outside of the United States, you are Lord, even of, of people who are very different from us, people who speak very different from us. And God, you are saving people all over the world. God, we know that you are at work in Guachochi, Mexico. God, we have been sending people from our church over the last couple of years to help train these men who are pastoring 
in Guachochi and in neighboring neighborhoods. God, we thank you so much that you've allowed us to take part in that and that that's been a blessing to those men, but, but also it's been a blessing to their churches and it's been a blessing to us to be able to send people uh, to do that teaching and, and to be a blessing in that way. God, we want to pray for these men who just graduated. We are so thankful that they've been able to be connected with the church in Guachochi to receive this training. God, I'm sure there are countless people all over Guachochi and neighboring villages that are going to benefit as a result of these men having been trained. God, there are going to be churches all over Mexico that are going to benefit from what these men have learned. And God, we know that you are glorified when the church is all about you. When we understand our Bibles and when we conduct church in such a way that all of it is to worship you, God, that pleases you. And so, God, we want to pray for these men that as they've received this training, that that would not be the end of their journey of learning, that they would constantly be students of the Scripture, that they would be reading the Scripture daily, that they would be studying it, that your Spirit would be revealing to them truth from the Scripture. God, we pray that as a result that their churches would be strengthened and that these pastors, as they preach and as they counsel and as they teach and as they shepherd, that all of that would be done even better as they grow in their understanding of Scripture, as they grow in their knowledge of you. God, we pray that you would make these churches strong, that these churches would see that you are an evangelistic God and that all throughout the Old Testament, you were even encouraging your people to be a blessing to the nations. And now in the New Testament, we see that you are telling us to go to the nations. God, that is why we as a church want to be a going church, a sending church, a praying church because we are aware of what you're doing all over the world and we want to be involved. So God, I pray that this, these churches would become even more evangelistic, that they would be telling everyone that they know, everyone they encounter about Jesus and what he has done for them. God, we thank you that you brought Pastor Josh Womble back safely to us and that he was able to get a negative COVID test and and get back here to the States. We are excited to hear from him all of what happened on the trip. And God, I pray that as we hear that, it would encourage us to think even more about how we can be involved, how we can go, how we can give, how we can pray. God, I pray that it would fire us up to want to be even more involved in the work that you're doing all over the world. God, we thank you that you include us in that. We know that you are the one who changes hearts. It's not us. We can't force anyone to believe the Spirit changes hearts. But God, you have invited us graciously to participate alongside of you in these things. And we are happy to do it. God, we pray now that as we turn our attention now to the book of Job, an interesting book, a book that's very different from what we typically spend our focus on, but, but yet we understand the Bible tells us that their scripture is, is profitable. And we know without a shadow of a doubt that there is profit for us to gain in the book of Job. So we ask your blessing as we start this new series. We pray for Josh as he's going to preach uh, in his preparation each and every week. God, we pray that you would be feeding us and teaching us through the book of Job. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Check. Check, 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 check. Check, check. I had a lot of running around planned today. I'll be still. Turn in the Bible, please, to the book of Job. It is the book before Psalms. It is one of the most interesting books in the Bible. And we are going to start today a long journey through it. It is 42 chapters. And I think that if you will commit to it, like we're going to commit to it, you will be greatly blessed. You will learn a lot. Your faith will be strengthened. If your faith is in question or you would admit that you don't have faith, I think God might birth faith into you through this book of Job, that we would find that God is better than everything. Our strategy here as a church is to just get people into the Bible as much as we can. So on Sunday mornings in our preaching, we pick books of the Bible and we walk through them. Uh, we just finished a few weeks ago the book of James in the New Testament. Many of you all remember that. And we are still ripping, reaping the great benefit of studying James together. I still think often about wisdom needed and the power of the tongue, right, uh, as we learned from James. And I am hoping and praying that we'll have the same commitment to the book of Job and that we will see God working through that. I want to use today as an introduction to it. This is a long book, 42 chapters. And at times, it becomes very uh, monotonous and repetitive and, uh, some might say, boring. And typically what we do here is we go verse by verse and we don't miss a single verse. And I've had about 10 of you all ask already, are you going to do that through Job? Please tell me not. I honestly read in a commentary and it said that if a pastor tries to take his congregation verse by verse through the book of Job, he will lead those people into more suffering than Job suffered himself, <laughs> which is a great quote. We are not going to go verse by verse through all of it. We're going to go verse by verse through the beginning and the end, and we will make sure we get the gist of the middle section, okay? When you read Job, though, it gets you thinking about how huge he was. Now, obviously, the point of life is God, and we're reminded over and over again that God is the one worthy of our worship, and God is deserving of all glory. We love it when the psalm says, not to us, O God, not to us, but to your name be the glory. The purpose of life is for God to be worshiped, and we will be forgotten. That's just the reality. But with Job, there is this idea of a lasting impact. And we're going to think about that this morning, a lasting impact. I was at a basketball gym yesterday, and I had a buddy with me, and I introduced him to a different buddy they had never met. And as you meet somebody new, you try to connect and say, do you know such and such, do you know such and such? And as he said that to somebody, the, the other guy said, man, how, of course I know him. Everybody knows him. It's this lasting impact. How can you forget somebody? Perhaps Job has as big of a lasting impact as any human being ever. Think about that. Nearly everybody knows about Job, certainly in the church, in religion. You've heard your grandma say the patience of Job. You've heard that phrase before, I'm sure. And everybody that has heard of Job and his story remembers him, don't they? I would guess right now, of all the stories in the Bible that you've heard, that if you've heard Job's story, you have not forgotten it. It is that memorable. Now, many of you may not have heard it because, as I said, it is tucked away, hidden here in the Old Testament. It is before Psalms, and Psalms get so much attention. And his name is spelled J-O-B. So until I said Job, everybody thought it was Job, right? That's the way it seems. But I want to think about a lasting impact of Job and his story. Today we're going to look at the first five verses. And we're not really going to get into the suffering. We're going to get into who Job was. But before we do that, I want to give you an introduction. I hope you are taking notes. 
we do not know who the author of Job is. Sometimes it's really helpful to know who the author of a book is because that explains their context. With Job, we don't know. But we do know this, Job is not the author. And the reason why we know that is because the first two chapters are all about what God is saying and doing and thinking, and Job knows nothing about that. From chapter 3 to chapter 42, Job has no idea of chapters 1 and 2. There's no way Job wrote it. He doesn't know the context that you and I know. And that becomes really a huge point of our study. The book had to have been written quite early. A lot of times people get into chronological Bibles. They want to read them in order that they've happened in history. We don't know when Job was written, but it must have been quite early. And here's why. There is no mention of the nation of Israel in the book of Job. There's no mention of the temple or the law from Moses. There's no mention of the covenant. There's no mention of the kings, the prophets, or not even the scriptures in this entire book. So clearly, it is early on. There are other things, too, like cities, and there are other things, too, like Job knew about Adam and Job knew about the flood. You'll you'll see this as we start studying. And those type of things put us way back. Another thing that puts us way back is that Job's wealth is measured in his possessions of livestock. It's not measured in his money. It's not measured in his land. His wealth is measured in his possession of livestock. That puts us way back into the early years of Genesis like we see with Abraham. So we don't know when Job was, but it had to have been a long time ago. But who wrote Job? We don't know, but it surely was an Israelite, and here's why. It surely was a faithful Israelite because the author of Job refers to God by the covenant name of Yahweh. The name that God told us about himself, Yahweh, is the name used in the book of Job. That lets us know that this is not somebody like Job's friends. This is not somebody outside of the covenant community. This is somebody who knows and understands God as God wants them to. Many people know the first two chapters, right? That divine, heavenly conversation between God and Satan. And many people know the last five chapters of the book of Job, 38 to 42, because that's where it all comes full circle and we see God finally answering to Job and revealing some things to Job. But very little is known about chapters 3 through 37, and that's a lot. And we're going to study every bit of it. But this is a fascinating book. This is a fascinating book, and it is a drama, and there is tension, and there are highs and lows, and there are ups and downs, and there are some awesome points made in the book of Job. There are some high points. There are some powerful, sad points. There are some low points in the book of Job. There are some just awesome, peculiar, interesting pieces of Job too. For instance, the behemoth and the leviathan, the sea monsters and the land creatures and the dragons, which that'll be another sermon. But yes, there are dragons in the book of Job. This book is fascinating while all of that is helpful for us to understand, most of all, Job is a book about suffering. And I don't know what brought you here today, but if you are suffering, then you could not have come to a better Sunday than us beginning a walk through the book of Job. You are about to learn about a man who suffered as much as anybody that you could ever imagine. I don't want to downplay your suffering, but I do want you to know that Job suffered greatly. This is a book about suffering, a long book about suffering. And while the Bible gives us many, many, many answers, Job is very intentional to give us discussion and discussion and discussion and chapter and chapter and chapter of not giving us the answer. Job, the author of Job wants us to sit down and become frustrated with suffering. He does. And we see Job and his friends very much so frustrated with suffering. 
the author of Job, and God being the author of Scripture, wants us to wrestle with suffering. Because Job is a book about suffering, the discussion of God and suffering raises all kinds of questions and thoughts, and that should be good for us. In the Old Testament and in ancient writings, there is something called a retribution principle. If you've been to school, you may have heard of this, the retribution principle. The retribution principle says that you do good, you prosper, you do bad, you, are, uh, uh, you will suffer. It's kind of like this idea of karma, right? The, the righteous prosper, the wicked suffer. And people talk about this a lot, and perhaps you just think that as being a good person, right? Maybe that's where you think luck is so important, right? And you think if you, if you do good, good comes to you. You do bad, it comes to you, right? Well, the book of Job is going to absolutely crush the retribution principle. Your life might show that that's true some of the time, but it is certainly not a biblical principle that the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. No, no, no. And this book will show us that. Job shows us that it's not true. We all know that life is hard, and we need to stop questioning God when we suffer We need to remember what we learned from James, that if we're going to ask God a question in our hardships, that it may not be why, but that it would be what. Do you remember that from James? Don't ask God, why are you doing this to me? Ask God, what are you doing in me and through me? There's a big difference in those questions, isn't there? Job teaches us that yet again. Don't ask why to God as if he could be wrong. Ask what to God as if you believe him and you trust your father who knows best. In this life, we will suffer. And Job shows us this. And as a Christian, you need to be ready for it. And as a Christian, you need to have a foundation that will get you through suffering. You need to have a hope that is more satisfying than the depths of suffering. As soon as we bring up suffering, there is a lot, there are a lot of great examples, aren't there? We know people suffering right now. I know that many of us limped in here, some physically, some emotionally. Some of you all are literally on the brink of saying, is it worth it? Should I keep trying? With your job, with your family, with your friends, with your self-esteem, with your own heart and identity, with your marriage, with your parenting, suffering is real. Some of it because of our bad decisions, some of it completely apart from anything we've done. I want to give you just a few Examples of suffering. I read the story of the young couple that got married and they were so happy to be married. They had finally found the one that God had made for them and sent for them. And on their honeymoon, the bride fell out the boat and drowned. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Or I remember several years ago when we baptized a young man here in this church right there on Easter Sunday, and his father did not come to see him baptized. So when he went home on Easter Sunday, he found his dad had committed suicide. You think life's hard for you. Life is hard for lots of people. It is. And Job knows this. And God wrote this book for people like us. God wrote this book for people that suffer. And even a little bit close to home and more recent, I think of one of the well-known heroes in the city of Louisville, the football coach Ty Scroggins at DeSales High School. It was so well-respected, it made national news on CNN. For just two weeks ago, he died at the age of 49 from COVID. He has children in high school, He was a high school coach. Everybody around here respected him. And at age 49, as such a positive influence among young people, he died. I think about his family and what they're dealing with now. There is a lot of suffering. 
The book of Job, this book that we're about to study, teaches us that people suffer. Christians suffer. Those who hope and trust in God suffer. Those who really strive to obey God will suffer. As the pastor in New York City, Rich Villadas, says, it is possible and necessary to hold together grief and God. It is possible and even necessary to hold together grief in God. Perhaps those are not at odds. Perhaps that's the very thing you needed to hear. May we all remember the words of Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 16, verse 33, when Jesus says to his followers in the world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus does not tell us that it will get easier, better, prettier, anything. He says it will be hard and you will have trouble. But he is the source to overcome it. Heaven is not that far away. So this book of Job is going to be a great, great study. And along these lines of introduction, I want to give you these six ideas to remember as we get into it. I get these six from John MacArthur. Number one, there are matters going on in heaven with God that believers know nothing about, yet they affect our lives. Okay, you need to know that. There's stuff going on right now in heaven with God that you and I know nothing about. And they're going to be an effect on our lives, and we're not going to know it, okay? Number two. Even the best effort at explaining the issues of life can be useless. When you say, I got no words, sometimes you're exactly right. When you say, I don't know, sometimes you're exactly right. When you say, I don't have any answers, I don't know what God's doing or why he's got me in this, you're exactly right. And the book of Job teaches us this. Number three, God's people do suffer. Bad things happen all the time to good people. So one cannot judge a person's spiritual life by his painful circumstances or his successes. Bad things happen. But in case you just need to be reminded, I know we think we're good people, but the Bible says there are no good people. R.C. Sproul once said, There was only one good person, and God killed him. Amen, right? What a thought. Number four, even though God seems far away, perseverance in faith is a most noble virtue since God is good and one can safely leave his life in God's hands. When you comfort yourself by saying, it's in God's hands, I'm leaving it in God's hands. I'm trusting God. You are exactly right. Number five, the believer in the midst of suffering should not abandon God, but draw near to him. So out of the fellowship can come the comfort without the explanation. Comfort without explanation. And then lastly, number six, suffering may be intense, but it will ultimately end for the righteous And God will bless abundantly. Those are six ideas from John MacArthur as we get into the book of Job. So Job is about suffering. But perhaps even more accurately, it is a book about persevering through suffering. It's not fair enough to just say it's about suffering. It is about learning to persevere through suffering as Job did. But actually, even more accurately than that, Job is a book about the true God who keeps people trusting in him during suffering. It is a book about a redeemer keeping God who has the power, a redeemer keeping God who has the power to keep his children over and against the strong yet limited efforts of the devil. It is a book that proves what 1 John says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. 
Job is a book that proves that Jesus is the treasure. It is a book that shows that knowing Jesus trumps anything and everything in this life. Job is a story that shows us what Jude says in his introduction to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Job was called by God. Job was loved by God. And Job was kept by God. And even though this story is full of heartbreaking, shocking tragedy, the truth of God as a loving and faithful father is as clear as ever when you read the book of Job. You are going to study this with all of us, and you are going to conclude, I pray, by God's grace and the Holy Spirit giving you eyes to see, life is hard, I don't understand it, but God is good, and he will not let me go. And I ask that you would believe it and hold on to it. I got to tell you all that I have found an amazing book. I found several, but I have found an amazing book on the book of Job. And it is outstanding. So I want to read to you what he says about the book of Job. He says, there is something raw and wild about this book. Something that defeats the scholars, something as immense and untamable as the Leviathan that erupts off the pages in chapter 41. Even the theology of this odd work is, in a sense, self contained and self referencing. When bound with the Bible, it assumes all the richness of that context. But in another way, this book stands alone, as Job himself does, against the tide. Perhaps for this reason, listen to this, Job sits easily on the shelf right alongside the greatest masterpieces of the world's secular literature, from Homer to Shakespeare. This is a book that can hold its own anywhere, whether in the university lecture hall or in the beer hall. And its hero is one who can strike a chord with people who have never felt drawn to any other biblical story or figure, including Jesus. Many reject Jesus, but no one rejects Job. Rather, the world rejects jo rather the world respects Job, and not with the grudging respect accorded Christ, but with a deep affinity untinged by reserve or fear. In the eyes of the world, Job is less a saint than a comrade in arms. He did not found a cult or a religion, and he has never commanded any kind of following. Who would want to follow Job? No, he is not even a religious figure at all, particularly, but is a simply a man. And more than that, simply a man who suffered. In fact, rather than preaching in favor of religion, Job preaches against it. And this is something that every sinner understands. It is something that every secular person understands too. And every poor person, an outcast person, and every Marxist, and every skeptic, and every outlaw and prisoner, and everyone who knows any kind of pain, simply by suffering so enormously, and by hanging on for dear life through it all, Job has won the world's heart and has come to embody the struggling sublimity of all mankind. Job is for everyone. That's good, isn't it? That is good. And I am excited about us getting into Job together. So look with me, if you will, at Job chapter 1. We're going to look at the first five verses. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. 
For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now whoever wrote Job is a great writer. Because in just those few verses right there, those first five verses, our hearts are drawn to Job. We like him. We are admiring him. We are interested in him and how his life is going to go. We are drawn to successful people and we want to ask questions like, how did you get so many animals and how do you handle so many kids and what time do you wake up and how much sleep do you get at night and how do you keep yourself sane, right? How do you balance all that, Job, right? Those are the questions we ask to successful people and these first five verses have us thinking that. Today we're not going to get into the suffering. That will start next week as the devil and God get into a conversation. But to set that up, I want us to just admire Job here this morning. Number one, Job was a godly man. I got four observations on Job. Number one, he was a godly man. In the very first verse of 42 chapters, it says he was blameless, upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Four different, strong, descriptive words of Job's character and Job's faith. Not one, four. Blameless, upright, feared God, turned away from evil. Job was a godly man. The first one says that he feared God. And that's interesting, that's the very first thing we hear because Job in the Bible begins the wisdom books. I think you all know this, right? Those books that are there in the very middle of your Bible are called the wisdom books. Y'all know what they are. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Job, right? And Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Solomon, those three books are very positive at times and we get them for inspiration But Ecclesiastes and Job are wisdom books too, but they kind of serve as a reverse wisdom or an anti-wisdom, if you you will. They teach us a lot of bad things that we should understand to make us wise. But do you remember, if you know your Bible, what the Proverbs say the beginning of wisdom is? The fear of the Lord. The first verse of the wisdom section of Scripture says there was a man who feared God. What a setting for wisdom, right? You're going to read Proverbs to get some wisdom, and you're going to read Ecclesiastes to get some wisdom, you're going to read Psalms to get some wisdom, but the first verse of the books of the wisdom section says, there was a man who feared God. In other words, if you know the scriptures, here is a wise man. Perhaps so much of success in life is not knowing what to do, but rather knowing who to look to, who to fear. Job feared God. Derek Thomas writes, this is the hallmark of biblical wisdom, fearing God, and Job possessed it. Proverbs 1-7 and Proverbs 9-10 both say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He goes on and he says, It is as we shall see a wisdom gained from knowing Jesus Christ, who, according to 1 Corinthians, has become for us wisdom from God. To know Christ is to possess God's wisdom. For Job, Derek Thomas goes on, Jesus Christ was still only a promise that God had made, a promise that one day a Redeemer would come. Yet Job believed that promise as did many others before and after his day. Job was wise in that he feared God. Job was wise in that in his sins he knew he needed needed a redeemer and he believed in that redeemer. He was, he feared God. But it also says that he was upright, right? And this is a good term, it's just the opposite of crooked. I never heard my dad use the word upright too much, but my dad sure uses the word crooked when he's talking about somebody that's crooked, right? He's a snake. He's a crook, right? 
I hear my dad talk like that. And that's exactly what this means. It means he was honest. It means he kept his word. It means he did the right thing. Folks, I know that we're looking for big, you know, profound answers to life. But sometimes terms like upright might be what's helpful. I've been teaching our kids since I've been dropping them off at school since preschool. This one phrase, and I say it to them most every morning, leaders do the right thing. You don't have to be the tallest or the smartest or the richest or the coolest or the cutest to be a leader. You do the right thing and you set the tone in doing the right thing and you can make a difference. Job was upright. He feared God. He was upright. But there's another phrase here, isn't there? Job was blameless. Mm, what a word. No blame? Does blameless mean guiltless? Well, that's a good question. When we start thinking about true Christianity, as you all know, we must include the redeeming factor that we get from God's word. Christianity, and we hit this so hard this week in our Acts Bible study, Christianity is not a, 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 a religion on morality, on how you can do better or try hard or how you can earn things with God. It is not that. And for as much as we may misrepresent it and turn it into that, we are wrong and failing. Christianity is a redeeming religion. It is that God loves you even though you sin. It is that God forgives you. It is that God will not hold your sins against you. It is that God will cause you to escape the judgment. God will give you life out of death. That's the message of Christianity. And this is so important as we hear the word blameless. One commentator says the secret begins with a solid grasp of the fact that being blameless is not quite the same thing as being guiltless. Objectively, these two conditions are identical, but they are attained through different routes. If someone is guiltless, it simply means that he has done nothing wrong. And if he is accused of wrong, then he is accused falsely, and that is all there is to it. But if someone is guilty. But if someone is blameless, it means something far more mysterious. It means that no matter how horrible his offenses may have been, listen to this, all the charges against him have been dropped. Blameless. Absolutely no blame attaches to him because the very one who he offended has exonerated him. In the words of Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. Hallelujah. God's covenant with us in Christ, listen to this. God's covenant with us in Christ is not that he will prevent us from ever committing a sin. That's not what the Bible teaches. God hasn't stopped you from sinning altogether forever. You will sin again. Job did too. But he was blameless. God's covenant with us in Christ is not that he will prevent us from ever, committing, ever again committing a sin, but rather he will forgive us for all of our sins. He will be faithful in forgiveness. Our part is to believe this. That is, to be blameless not so much in our outward conduct, though obviously we strive for this, but in our faith and our trust in the Lord's faithfulness. Do you believe that God hates your sins? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins? And do you believe that if you trust that fully, God has forgiven all of your sins, and so now you don't want to sin anymore? And every time you do, He will keep forgiving them because you don't want to. This is what it means to be blameless. Blameless means everything that I do, I'm forgiven of. Everything that I do, I'll admit. Everything that I do, you can know about. Everything that I do, I will confess. Blameless means God forgives sins. And even though he forgives them, I don't want to keep sinning. Job was blameless. What a thought. And even though Job was upright and blameless and feared God, we get one more term here in verse 1. He turned away from evil. The author of Job wants us to know that Job tried and he cared and he tried hard. It didn't necessarily come easy. There was evil presented to him on a regular basis. He saw things and he experienced things. And life was challenging for him too. And it took a devoted discipline and faith to say, I see evil and I'm turning away. I could do that, but I'm turning away. He was a faithful man. Job was a godly man. Number two, Job was a family man. Can't miss that, can we? 
10 kids. He had more kids than anybody else in our church, although we have a few families trying to catch him. He had 10 kids. He had seven sons and three daughters. He knew what it was like to change diapers. He had heard babies cry. He knew what it was like to try to put food on the table. He knew what it was like to train kids up, right? He knew what it was like to lead children, to grow up into adulthood. These are the things that we struggle with. He was a family man. Not just was he a family man because we see that, but we hear that he had a relationship with his wife. Later on, we're going to see in chapter 1 and chapter 2 that his, he and his wife talked about his situation. They talked about his health. They talked about his spiritual life. They talked about God together, he and his wife did. Job was a family man. But perhaps the best way that we see that Job was a family man was because he cared about his children's spiritual life. Even more specifically, he cared about their sins, and he thought it was bad. Job was a family man. Number three, Job was a wealthy man, and we are so thankful that he is a wealthy man in this book of Job because his wealth earned him nothing. It got him nowhere. I know you've heard the phrase before, you can't take it with you, right? Your wealth is not going to get you anywhere with God, seriously. Job was a wealthy man, though, and it wasn't a negative against him. And this is really important. Okay, this is really important. The Bible teaches us a whole lot about wealth, and we have to be very careful when we start talking about money. I want to remind you of just a few of the phrases that come to mind when we start talking about wealth and money and having things. The Bible says you cannot serve God and money. You choose right now which one is going to be Lord of your life. You cannot have two. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. If you're still rather getting than giving, your heart is not quite in line with God's. The love of money is the root of all evil. It is not money that is the problem. It is your love of money that is the problem. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You are not those things. These are all just quotes from the Bible. Who are you without those is what is important. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Is it worth it? Is it worth it to lose focus of God and character and integrity over things? Well, remember the words of Jesus? It is hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible tells us a lot about money, does it not? But I want to read you yet again from a commentator on what he says about Job. Job was a wealthy man. We know this because in verse 2, after it introduces the family, here's what it says. Job possessed 7,000 sheep, this is verse 3, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. That's a lot. There had to be a lot of fence. There had to be a lot of land. There had to be a lot of grass. There had to be a lot of straw. There had to be a lot of shovels, right? Had to be a lot of time, a lot of early mornings, right? A lot of long days, a lot of sweat, a lot of backache, a lot of soreness, a lot of calluses, right? Takes a lot to feed that many, take care of that many. There's a lot of wealth there, as you know. But listen to this quote on Job's wealth. But Job's wealth did not cling to him. It flowed through him. He was not so much a collector of wealth as a distributor of it. Not an owner, but a steward. That is why he could say so readily at the end of chapter 1, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. All the wealth that he had in one day was, bam, taken from him. And it did not disrupt his faith at all. Imagine. Imagine how many examples you know where just the tiniest bit of your wealth has been taken from you. Somebody dents your new car, right? Somebody takes some money from you. Somebody steals your wallet. Somebody just takes your debit card, which you can call and cancel like that, and they got fraud protection, and people get out of character. People lose their faith over that. People get rude and ugly over that. People start to insult over that. Job never did 
And he didn't lose his wallet. He lost everything. Job lost 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys. And did not lose his faith. His wealth did not have him. Job was that rarest of millionaires, he writes. One who was not filthy rich, but rather clean rich. Not rich as sin, but rich as righteousness. What a good description. He had stuff. He had money. He had wealth. But it did not have him. And I want to encourage you here today that that is possible. It may be challenging, but that is possible. For you, with all of your successes and all of the blessings of God and all of your money, for you to be able to say, it does not have me. I surrender all of this to God, and we will use it for his glory. Job was a wealthy man. But lastly, 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 Job was a considerate man. And I'm specifically using this word considerate because last week in Hebrews 10, The sermon was on we cannot neglect each other. You remember that? And the very word that we see in Hebrews 10 is we are to consider others. We are to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting each other. You remember that from Hebrews 10 last week? And Job was a considerate man. What it tells us there in verses 4 and 5 is stunning, isn't it? It's certainly stunning in our day. His children were happy. His children lived good lives. His children loved being together. They got along. He had seven sons, and it sounds like each son had a day, like seven days of the week. It sounds like one had Sunday, one had Monday. And every day they'd get together and have a party together and have a good time. And that's awesome. You like get-togethers with family, and they did too. But when they would do that, and and remember, Job doesn't tell us, this. the book of Job doesn't tell us anything that they've done wrong. It doesn't mention sin. Don't let your mind go to the fact that they're sinning. It doesn't say that. This could have been very much so a God-honoring party. We don't know. They were having a good time together, it says. But even in that, it says that Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning. Because he was considering the spiritual lives of his children. I thought about saying, if I didn't say anything else this morning, would you get committed enough to Jesus that you would rise early for the sake of those in your household? Can we be humbled here today that we will never again complain about our husband? or our wives, or our children, or our grandchildren, if we have not been up early on our knees. You think life is automatic when it's this difficult? You think becoming like God Almighty is easy when life is this distracting? No, it's not. We got God himself describing Job as the greatest of all people in verse 3. And even he did not coast. Even he was disciplined for spiritual sake. Now, I know he was disciplined as a farmer, and you do too. He was up early, had his hat on, had his gloves, had his overalls on. We know that. He had all that. He worked his butt off, outwork anybody. We know that about Job. That's not what I'm talking about. He was up early for the spiritual lives of his children. If you want to be a real church person, commit to that. If you want to be a real Christian, commit to that. Look what it says. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Now, remember I said earlier, there's no mention here of the law of Moses and understanding that. And it shows us that it goes way back. This is one of the neat things about the Bible. Before the sacrificial system was introduced, there were burnt offerings. In Genesis chapter 8 with Noah, when he gets off the boat, it says he offered a burnt offering. That is a long time ago, right? 
That was a long time ago. When Noah gets off the ark, he offers burnt offering. And a burnt offering is just saying, hey, we know that we sin. It's not for specific sins. It is, hey, we know that we sin. We know that we are in need. Oh, Father, forgive us. Here's an offering that shows that we care. That's what burnt offerings are. And, and Job here, which you see in the Old Testament, right, before we get to understanding fully that Jesus Christ is the high priest. Remember, Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. Job here, which we see common in the Old Testament, Job is fun functioning as a priest for his family. Job is going to God early with a burnt offering on behalf of his children. He is praying for them. Now, will that ultimately save them? No. But that is a shadow of what redemption looks like. And his children are to understand that, there are, that they are sinners. And his children are to understand they need to go to God to be forgiven of their sins. And in Job's example, as a priest over them, it should be working in their lives. And we don't see any reason to doubt it. Look what it says. Job would send and consecrate them and would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Man, what a dad. What a dad. Now let's think about this for a second. I know if you're like me, you start thinking of all the ways they could have sinned at a party, right? Having a big party, lots of things going on. Could have had some guests there that probably weren't focused on God. Could have had too much to drink. That's possible. Could have gotten into talking about things they shouldn't have been talking about, right? I mean, this could go in a lot of directions. That's not what Job had in mind. It may have been the ripple effect. But Job was such a godly man that Job wasn't thinking, hope my kids don't get drunk. Job was thinking, I hope their hearts don't go against God. I hope my kids' hearts don't go against God. When the most we can say is, I hope they find some good friends, I hope they're doing good in school, I hope they stick with sports. I hope they find a good job. They're doing well. When that is our desire, we are so far away from Job's example for us. I want to find some dads who are up early saying, God, my kids' hearts, guard them, God. Give them a new heart. Save them. Fill it with goodness. Fill it with the Spirit. Let them know your love. God, my kids' hearts. What an example we have in Job. Hey, man, this awesome. Hey, man, this impressive. Job was a godly man, a family man, a wealthy man, and he was a considerate man, considerate of the faith of his children, the well-being of his children, the souls of his children, the salvation of his children, the destiny and the eternal life, the heaven or hell, the judgment that awaits his children, that they would be forgiven of their sins. Job knows that the God he follows forgives sins. And if you're here today, I want to remind you that he does. That there is only one God. And though it would have been thousands of years ago, the same God that was working mightily in Job's life is the same God that we worship here today at Fairdale. And he loves us. And he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. And if you will turn to him and say, God, forgive me. I'm not here because I'm good. I'm not necessarily here because I'm bad. I'm here because I need you. You will understand that God says that because of your sins, that's why Christ died. And if you will believe, he'll forgive you of your sins. He will receive you. The big word there is called repenting. It is turning away from whatever you're living for and turning to him. It is turning away from sin and turning to salvation in Jesus. Job understood this. Job understood that we need to turn to God. And so he lived in such a way that he was helping his children turn to God. Now we see the lasting impact that I mentioned at the beginning. And he is such a good example in these first five verses that that's going to have a lasting impact on us. At least I pray 
But as I said at the start, the lasting impact is not because of how good Job was. The lasting impact that Job's life has is what we're about to see beginning next week. It goes all downhill from here. Job's life gets incredibly worse. But the beautiful thing of this story is that while his life truly gets shipwrecked, his faith doesn't. He does not let go. Struggle, stumble, yes, but he does not let go. He did not believe God for what he got from God. He did not. He believed God because God is the only answer. I've used his story many times. But we had a man in this church for nearly 80 years. Had fallen away, had really gotten out of it. Fell in love with worldly things under his confession. Was a master woodworker. Fixed cars like nobody else. Neglected church all the time. And when he was about 70 years old, God gave him cancer so badly that he was going to die. And Mr. Ray Harris got back involved in church. And as many of us have heard, I'm thankful, he would say, that God gave me this cancer. I have neglected my soul, my faith. I've neglected God. I've neglected Jesus for too many years caught up in worldly things. God has left a lasting impact upon our church through the suffering and death of Mr. Ray Harris because of cancer. Because through the cancer, taking his life, he found Jesus. The book of Job is exactly like this. We see the lasting impact of a life because Job held on to Christ through it all. But what Job will teach us so beautifully is that while Job was holding on to Christ, what was going on in the heavens was that Christ was holding on to Job. May you believe it. And may you hold on to. Father in heaven, thank you so much for our church getting a chance to study this great book. God, we are thankful for your word. We submit ourselves to it. And we ask, dear God, that your word would grip our lives, that we would be ready for suffering, and through suffering, God, you would hold us tight. God, may we be faithful to you because you're so faithful to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus is coming soon. Call every sinner, wake up the same. Let every nation shout of your faith. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bright way. church ready for you every heart longing for our king we see even so come lord jesus come and even so come 
Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing even so. So come, Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. So we So come, Lord Jesus, come. And even so come, Lord Jesus, come. And even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Our benediction this morning will be from Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.